Welcome to the Fantasy NASCAR Podcast. I am Race for the Prize. Please go to raceforthepriz.com if you would like to contribute and show your support. Today we are talking, and you can also get access to the Fantasy NASCAR spreadsheet that can help you make better picks and enjoy the process better. Today we're talking Xfinity at Atlanta. Yes, Atlanta is a super speedway. Yes, Xfinity Atlanta is a super speedway, but it's a little bit different. If you don't stay long for this podcast, then know that the strategy, the typical tried and true effort of stacking in the back at Daytona and Talladega is not necessarily the best approach. In my opinion, it is not an approach that I will deploy. Can it work? Yes. Has it worked? Yes. And I don't believe you need to deviate too much from that, but we'll talk about what could be the actual pattern, what could be a better reference point, what this race might look more like. And a lot of it comes down to the package. As we mentioned yesterday, the Xfinity car is the true staple of stock car racing. It's got horsepower, it has less drag, it has less downforce. And at super speedways, that means that Atlanta, in particular, turns more into an old school super speedway. The cars can get more spread out, not completely spread out. Imagine IROC, possibly, maybe a little bit more spread out than that. But we're talking old school Daytona. The restarts are still hairy. The first several ra- uh, laps of a run are still pack racing and are hairy and can demolish the field. But as the run extends, they separate a little bit. They don't get complete separation. They still are able to run side by side and we get side drafting, we get arrow loose and the wrecks will happen. But for the most part, the wrecks that happen in the Xfinity series at Atlanta tend to be, and and mind you, this is a small sample size, one to two car wrecks. Spin out, tagging the wall. There's enough spread out, spread throughout the field that drivers, unless they want to have the old classic arc of pileup wreck where you just run into the crash in front of you, tend to not turn into pileups. It tends to be a couple get collected and then we move on with their day. We can get plenty of wrecks that way, but we don't necessarily expect half of the field to be wiped out. Thus, we don't expect half of the field to go from the back to the front through attrition and we get a huge stack in the back lineup let's first start so that that's just you know the actual racing in itself and we'll talk more about the actual racing and how it compares to other tracks and how we construct our lineups but first let's just dive into previous optimal not necessarily top six lineups typically when we talk about super speedways we say the optimal lineup It's the top six drivers. They all fit in because you got cheap place differential. That's not the case at Atlanta. Two of our optimal lineups are not top six lineups. You could not afford the top six, which is a clue that Atlanta is slightly different. It's nothing to get our pants in a wad and to freak out about. We just need to make simple adjustments. And you'll thank me if you can hang in there for this podcast, because we're going to go over every adjustment that you need to make. And you should be able to leave this pod feeling pretty comfortable, pretty confident about how to build your lineups. We'll look at Atlanta 2022. It appears close to being a stack in the back, but not completely, because in that 2022 optimal lineup, we had A.J. Omendinger starting 7th, and Austin Hill starting 14th. Although, neither really freak you out in the Xfinity Series at a super speedway. We know they're very successful, can win races. And Austin Hill starting 14th, not really much of a problem. And Austin Hill in 2022, this wasn't completely new to him. We had already seen him have success in the Truck Series and the Xfinity Series at super speedways. Then you get Herbst at 24, Mason Massey at 26, Kyle Weatherman at 28, Brian Vargas 32. Thus far, it feels a lot like a typical Daytona. Nothing really big to change, just a slight modification and a willingness to take some of these star drivers starting near the front. 
2022, second Atlanta race. We got Austin Hill again, starting fifth. Again, that's your slight alteration. You can't simply just pour in the drivers in the back so far through the two dry races that we've looked at. You got Tyler Reddick starting 22nd in the big machine vehicle. And we knew that in 2022, that big machine vodka or whichever brand it was that given weekend for big machine out of Nashville was a pretty solid car. Nothing that matters too much in Atlanta, but it does matter a little bit more at Atlanta than Daytona or Talladega if we want a winner or a lap leader. And he would later go on that season to win at Texas, if you remember. Actually, he probably had already won at Texas by that point. Can't remember for sure. No, I think the Texas one was later in the year in the Xfinity Series. Ryan Truex starting 21st, Castle at 18th for Cullig. Remember, this was a, I believe this was a Cullig season. Make note of that. Cal C 29, Ryan Vargas starting 36th. Seems like a stack in the back with a little slight alteration, taking a top tier driver. Let's look at last season. The one that's going to make you scratch your head and worry. And now, I will note that in this 2022 race, this was not in top six lineup. You could not afford the top six fantasy scores in the second Atlanta race. They're pretty spread out. I think Vargas was somewhere around 13th in fantasy points. We'll look at that in a second. So the optimal lineup did leave money on the table, but it wasn't a top six build. You couldn't afford it. 23 first race. There's Austin Hill again. And then what's going to worry you is the rest of the top six started between 5th and 13th, well, except for Brennan Poole. Kligerman, 13. Dan Hemrick, 11. Brennan Poole, Brett, Brennan Poole, 29th. Brett Moffat, 12th. Riley Herbst, 5th. That's going to freak you out. That's going to freak out a lot of fantasy players. And rightfully so, we're dealing with a small sample size. And we have one example where it is the complete opposite of what we have always thought. We jump back over to the second Atlanta race. Didn't feel a little bit more comfortable. No one's starting in the top 10 in this one. Haley, 13th to 4th. Kyle Sieg, 34 to 7. Daniel Hemrick, another colored car, 11th to 2nd. Brett Moffat, 27 to 11. Parker Kligerman, 17 to 8. Kaz Grala, 31 to 14. Pretty much a stack in the back. And we have one outlier. Also, this 23. It was the top five drivers, but Kaz Grala, I believe, scored something like eighth most fantasy points, so it was not a top six. That is denoted by the asterisks. So it's not a complete stack in the back. It's pretty close. What does this remind me of? Well, I sat down and thought, hmm, this is a big, long track. It does get a little spread out. Everyone stays in the lead lap. Restarts can get kind of hairy. That sounded familiar to me. That sounded like a... And then I looked at these lineups, and they looked familiar to me. And it reminded me, not completely of Daytona, although it is pretty close to Daytona and Talladega. It reminded me of Fontana lineups. It reminded me of Pocono lineups. Big, long tracks. Drivers spread out. Everybody on the lead lap. Harry restarts, often restarts at the end where people gain positions. That's what it seemed like to me. I'm not going to go through all of the previous Pocono Optimals, maybe later in the week if we get absolutely bored, or all the previous Fontana or Auto Club Speedway, whatever you want to call it, lineups, maybe we can. But in those lineups, it was often a not necessarily a full stack in the back. It was a halfback. A lot of the value in your lineup were drivers starting in the back that weren't highly likely or weren't as likely to score a bunch of points like at Daytona and Talladega, but absolutely had the chance. And some of them were going to come through. But then the other half of your lineup was top finishes and lap leaders. Now, I'm not going to say that that is the key and that is absolutely the way to go. Because this is not purely Fontana. This is not purely Pocono. There's a scent of it. There's a smell of it. That is one direction you can go in. 
but also the other direction is to follow the Daytona and Talladega path, which is not wrong either. Maybe the plan is to split the difference. Whereas we have the stack in the back Daytona Talladega idea, then we have the half back Pocono idea, Fontana idea, where we do chase place differential. Now, let me preface this by saying if I get top tier drivers starting in the back of the field, then yes, I'm absolutely chasing them. Like we have saw in, you get a landing castle and decent equipment in 18th, yes. Ryan Truex, 21, Tyler Reddick, yes. And so if we're presented with top tier drivers and top tier equipment starting in the back half of the field, obviously that's going to push more away from the half back and more stack in the back because we have more drivers in the back that we can trust where we can stack four to five drivers. If we're not presented with that situation where there's a lot of good drivers starting in the back half of the field, which I don't think is going to be the case, but you never really know. There is rain projected for Friday. We'll see how that works out. If you wash out practice, we could get a decent amount of cars starting in the back. And if we get a decent amount of cars starting in the back, then yeah, you're going to stack in the back. If drivers qualify similar to where they are priced, then maybe I am only chasing three place differential drivers in the back, taking three towards the front, maybe two top tier drivers, and that third guy in my top tier, a maximized place differential play. So again, to break that down is three in the back, three towards the front, two top tier lap leader types, and then one top tier maximizing place differential. Although I know I might not get double digit, but close to double digit and close to a podium. That's kind of the way that I'm building. Hopefully this makes sense. And what Atlanta is slightly different. It's not full blown super speedway. It hasn't completely tested positive to super speedway. It has shown a lot of the symptoms. It's got the super speedway cough, but it's not necessarily in the emergency room. It's not on ventilation. It doesn't have wires up its nose and down its throat but there are little rashes and blemishes appearing on the skin and the pupils have dilated a little bit. Eventually it may become more super speedway. It may completely change when the moon goes full, but we're not there yet. Still a little bit of Fontana, still a little bit of Pocono left in this beast. And I'm not really committed on going full stack in the back. Obviously, that can all change when we see the starting grid. Now, the next conversation that we need to have, we could possibly look a little bit closer at these lineups. We'll put the Atlanta optimal lineup from 23 on the screen. And again, you can clearly see that it was not the top six drivers. You couldn't afford top six. You still got pretty close. And a little bit more scary, we talked about this with the Cup Series. Sometimes when you know, the top six wasn't a complete stack in the back, there were still plenty of drivers scoring a lot of points from the back. You'll remember that yesterday we talked about the Cup Series, that even sometimes you had a lot of guys starting up near the front, but there were easy pivots to stack in the back drivers who scored just as many points. I don't believe that is necessarily the case. I mean, you look at the 2023 spring race, Eight of the 10 cars in the top 10 started towards the front. And the top six still fit into the optimal lineup. That is not a stack in the back situation. 2022, still, as you can see with the red, most of these cars started in the first, you know, top 15 positions. Look at 2022. Yeah, we got some guys in the back, but there were also, you, know, you had a Riley Herp starting 24th. That definitely helps. But you did get Massey and Weatherman and Vargas surviving and getting through. It was a bit of a half-half mixed bag, a little bit more in the back. But clearly, the Cup Series and Truck Series much more lean into stacking back than Xfinity Series. 
And I think by pivoting a little bit over to not completely just jamming in the back, you may be able to separate from the field and not just separate from the field in terms of ownership. I believe you're going to make better picks and you're going to score more fantasy points. And we can talk about leverage. We can talk about ownership. Everybody's going to do a certain build, so I can be different. Okay, that's one thing. But being different doesn't really mean anything if you're wrong. Being different doesn't mean anything if you pick the wrong drivers. And we're not talking about just the drivers that wreck. We're talking about drivers that score points. You can be cute and pick someone who doesn't project a bunch, score a bunch of points, and then they don't score a bunch of points. And you have to look at yourself in the mirror and say, maybe I'm not that cute after all. You can be cute and go with low ownership and pick drivers. But if those drivers don't score points, then you're just throwing your money away. At some point, being cute isn't worth it anymore. Saying, look at me, isn't worth it anymore. And you gotta go back to square one. You gotta go back to the drawing board and you gotta start picking good drivers. I think that's what I said a couple weeks ago and someone goes, oh my golly, you figured it out. He's a genius. He's suggesting that we pick the good drivers, not the bad ones. I know, the guy said he wasn't being sarcastic, but there is a whole side to this industry that doesn't wanna pick good drivers and I get it. I understand that if you have a computer that makes picks for you, if you have an algorithm or a sim or a projection system that makes 150 lineups for you and you don't even really do anything other than click a button, then obviously that's a good way to go. But if you're hand building, pick good drivers. No reason to fight about it. It's just and there's no point in disagreeing. It's just you got to be honest and transparent about what you're doing. You can't pretend that you're doing something that you're not. Anyway, um, what? So beyond the stack in the bay, the next thing that we have to tackle is well, what about this top tier piece? What about these drivers starting up front? Obviously, when we stack in the back and we're taking guys in the back, that is a little bit random. And we're picking drivers that might have a little bit better equipment, might have a little bit better of experience, might have a little bit better results, but those can also be random as well. When we're picking top tier drivers that are going to score fantasy points in Atlanta at this super speedway, it is not going to be random. We need to make educated picks because we have to predict who's going to lead laps. This is the part where you might be squirming. No one likes to pick a lap leader at Daytona. No one enjoys selecting a lap leader at Talladega. It's very hit or miss, you say. You can't really predict how the draft is going to work out and who is going to jump to the front and stay up front. While that is true at Atlanta in a cup race, or maybe not Atlanta in a cup race, at Daytona or Talladega in a cup race or a truck race, the leads can switch. On a whim, Atlanta, as I reminded you earlier, it's not full-blown super speedway. There is a spread to this. They do separate. Now, it's not Fontana driving away from the field, and it's not Pocono driving away from the field. There's still going to be cars around, but there aren't you know, 120 laps of side-by-side -side pack racing where a lead can be stolen away in a second. They will spread out, and yeah, the car in second place is not going to be very far behind, but it's not going to be easy for that car to get a push, to get around, to get to the lead, and the risk of pulling that maneuver often requires a car at your bumper to push you forward, and even then, you're only going to pull ahead a little bit and then have to wait and be challenged again by the car behind you, so the risk does not really align with the reward. So you can see a driver pull out in front and stay out front. And what type of driver is that? Well, before we even say what type of driver, you can just say, who is that? Who has that been? And I'll go ahead and just put some of my notes on the screen to make this a little bit easier for you to follow. In the 2022 spring race, the first race, it was Austin Hill. And Austin Hill did it three out of the four races. The home state Georgia boy, three of the races, Austin Hill has been a lap leader and controlled the race. It makes our life a little bit easier. If we're trying to select the lap leader this week, 
one thing we're seeing is it's consistently top tier drivers. We're seeing it's consistently the same drivers and those drivers are gonna be in the field. So picking a lap leader, taking a four drivers in the back and then having to pick two people up front, not gonna be that hard because we got Austin Hill in the field. Selecting drivers from the front at Daytona and Talladega is scary. At Atlanta, the initial thought is, oh, this is scary too, but it's not because we've got Austin Hill to lean on and we've got top tier drivers to lean on. So in 2022, it was Austin Hill, it was AJ, and then you also had Noah Gregson and Trevor Bain, both got collected in wrecks, so they did not end up in winning lineups. 2022 second race, you had Austin Hill, you had Tyler Reddick, another top tier driver, and you had AJ again, doesn't end up in the optimal lineup because of a loose wheel. You get AJ, and then in 23, you get Austin Hill. 23, second race, we get Haley, we got Josh Berry, another top tier driver, not off in the lineup because of a wreck, and Sheldon Creed, who has a pit issue, not in the optimal lineup. Do you see the pattern? Well, if you can read the screen, then you're already ahead of me. Besides the fact that these are all top tier drivers that are making up, you know, the one and two or the one, two, three spots of the optimal lineup, scoring a lot of fantasy points, them, and then you combine the guys in the back that are maybe wing and prayers, but your typical super speedway plays differential superstars. But the guys at the top that we don't like to pick, the guys in the front that we don't like to pick at Daytona and Talladega, that's not been the case at Atlanta Xfinity builds. So the first pattern, obviously, oh, well, I see a couple of familiar names that keep repeating. Yeah, Austin Hill, AJ, all right. Well, your next step is to realize that well, the teams, obviously, Austin Hill drives for RCR. Sheldon Creed in 23 drove for RCR. Colleague, AJ, colleague, AJ, colleague, Haley. What do we know about Colleague Motorsports? They are the kings of trimming out. They have been very well known, even when they weren't quite the best team or considered a top tier team, of going out and qualifying on the pole they would trim out then they get in the pack and they would struggle but we know that when it comes to pure speed colic produces that so when we go to atlanta where it is basically a pure speed track now at a super speedway should it be any surprise that we have seen aj twice and justin haley producing superior results last but not least who is colic in a technical alliance with None other than RCR. Their shops are on the same campus. They share notes. So when it comes to team speed and team trimmed out, it should not be a surprise that both of these teams have, for the most part, controlled slash dominated at Atlanta. So this weekend, when you're building for Atlanta, one of the ways that you can build is take half of your lineup from the back or four drivers from the back. It depends on who we get where. And then from your top tier, circle those Cullig drivers. Circle those RCR drivers. Austin Hill, Jesse Love. Let's look at the entry list. Who we get in the car for Cullig. I don't know if I necessarily want to believe and Josh Williams, but he will probably be affordable in a college car that will have top 10 speed. So we'll get Josh Williams. We get AJ Allmendinger back in the ride. Do we get anybody else for colleague? I guess Van Gisbergen is going to be back. It'll be interesting to see what SVG does where he is priced. I don't imagine he's gonna lead a bunch of laps in this race, but he should have a very fast race car. We will just have to wait and see on that one. That's going to do it for the Atlanta Xfinity Podcast. Please make sure you're liking these videos. The likes have increased tremendously and I very much appreciate it. 
One of the reasons why I cannot quit this thing is because of you. And I'm here year after year because of you, because of the views, because of the likes and the sharing and the comments are near and dear to my heart. I mean a lot. I mean that genuinely. I also very much appreciate the Venmo, the PayPal and the Cash App support. It goes a long way. It goes a long way when you purchase the spreadsheet for a month or for a weekend. Or maybe you want to work out a deal here or there. I'm always open to helping you out if you can help me out. It means a lot. The tips that you send through, those mean a lot. I'm very thankful. I'm very blessed to have you. I love you guys. Crypto Light's fantastic.